Good morning or afternoon. Um, is that Capel from who from Cloud Custodian? Can you hear me? Oh, hi. hi. Yes, I can hear you. Um, I just realized I'm not logged in as the the host of the, the and so I just wanted to check to make sure that you could share your slides and present if um, you have slides. I, I do, and I checked that, and it seems to work. Okay, super. Um, then I can just be Sarah Allen, and I don't have to be Sig Security anonymously. Sure. So um, I will put the notes in the. Um, chat for people who are joining. Um, we have a tradition of everybody adding themselves for attendance. Um, and then I'd also like to call out for the regular uh, members, anybody who's sitting in front of a computer who's willing to scribe. We just take notes uh, live in a Google Doc so that people who can't attend um, can uh, get highlights and decide whether they're going to watch the videos. And we, we generally post the videos, um, one of our fabulous um, staff people at CNCF um, post the videos shortly after the call, so usually in uh, the next day or so. Um, so I also want to let the uh, regular group folks know that we are, um, we've been small group talking about going back to what we were doing in 2018 and early 2019, where we had every other week presentations and every other week working group meetings, which were more discussions and check-ins and um, talking through uh, different proposals. And so this is um, unusual because we've had two presentations in a row, but that's because Brendan um, couldn't be here because Cube, um, Cube Forum is happening in some place um, that he had to travel to. So um, we're accommodating uh, Brendan who's been active and had a um, discussion topic that he wanted to cover and because it's before the holidays, I didn't want to just move this to January. So, um, so if there's time at the end, um, we'll talk a little bit about, we'll cover um, some team logistics and um, discussion topics about, um, you know, things that are top of mind. Um, but if the, if needed, um, we will spend the whole time um, discussing Cloud Custodian. And I'm excited to have, um, uh, Capel here to do a presentation and I talked to one of your colleagues on Slack and suggested that the presentation be 20 or 30 minutes and then um, we would have time for discussion and I want to allow that time for as much as um, uh, people have questions and, and things that they want to discuss. So thanks for posting the slides in the chat. Um, I will just wait a moment for people to add themselves for attendance uh, before we get started. Can, do I have a volunteer scribe? Since it's mostly a presentation, I can scribe if needed. And then we have a place in the um, at the in the agenda that if you have announcements, please type them into the agenda. Or if you're, um, or feel free to put them in the chat if you don't aren't able to um, use Google Docs. And uh, and then if um, then we don't necessarily have to take time for the announcements if we um, if the discussion is is um, taking longer. So. With that, um, I will ask Capel to introduce yourself and Cloud Custodian and tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're here. Cool, thank you. Uh, so I'm here with uh, my co-presenters, uh, uh, John Mark Walker from Capital One and Andy Long from Microsoft. Uh, I work at AWS. Uh, so we've been interested in sort of uh, having Custodian be part of the CNCF as an incubating sandbox project. And uh, as part of sort of the new process around that, uh, we've been 
uh, we were told that we should come talk to Thick Security and sort of give a background on the project. Um, and uh, that's what this presentation is about. Um, I'm first going to hand over to uh, to John Mark so that he can do a bit of an intro in context uh, to the project's history. Uh, John, it looks like you're muted. I, I was. Thank you for uh, catching that because I started to speak and uh, <laughs> started to check. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is John Mark Walker. I run the Open Source Program Office at Capital One. Um, and, you know, just to get into a little bit of a stage setting here, this is something that we've been talking about for, I don't know, at least a year now, probably before my time, before joining Capital One. Um, but I, since I've joined here last, uh, since August, uh, this has moved uh, top of mind for me. Um, and it's very important to me that we, uh, you know, become and improve upon, you know, previous uh, uh, open source efforts. And this is one way to do that. And so one of the things we're looking to get out of this session uh, is a series of uh, some sort of working relationship as well as a, you know, next steps we can follow to, so that we can make sure that we, you know, get things uh, across the finish line at, at some point. So I'll be looking for a direction from the rest of the SIG on that uh, uh, at the end of this. Uh, but but we're, we're finally, you know, at the point where we can say, yes, we absolutely want to do this. It took a lot of time and effort to get here. So, um, you know, it's a, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a journey and uh, we're looking forward to continuing that journey uh, with the rest of y'all. Um, I just want to want to introduce myself and just kind of lay the, the groundwork there and just say that the, you know, the technology is relatively mature. It's been in development for over three years now. Uh, I think it's something that would be appreciated by, you know, the rest of the community. Um, I'm hoping that some of you on the call are at least somewhat familiar with it. Um, but with that, without further ado, I'm going to turn back over to Kapil and um, I look forward to seeing what we can come up with. Thank you, John. Uh, so what is it? Uh, so Cloud Custodian is a stateless rules engine uh, that is intended to help sort of uh, customers and users uh, manage their cloud, public cloud accounts at scale. Um, so by way of background, so when uh, I was at Capital One and we were sort of first going to the cloud, um, sort of recognized that as, you know, dealing with, you know, regulations and, and security and compliance aspects around cloud was uh, resulting in, we want, wanted to automate as much of that as possible. Uh, the natural tendency for organizations as they, as they go into the, uh, start out their journey in the cloud uh, tends to be around um, sort of writing one-off scripts uh, around these different requirements and sort of extrapolating forward from that start of that journey into the future, I was seeing a place where we would have hundreds of these random scripts and there would be questions about, you know, who deployed them, how were they well tested, uh, what was the operations around them. Uh, and so, you know, that was going to be a bit of a mess. And so wanted to sort of take a step back from that and try to look at how to deal with that problem holistically. And so Custodian tries to be sort of that uh, Swiss Army knife uh, around all the different concerns an organization may have around uh, their cloud footprint, uh, be it uh, managing security, be it managing cost optimization. And to do that, it integrates very deeply with whatever the cloud provider's uh, native tooling is. Um, so, you know, Google Cloud Functions, Amazon Lambda, uh, you know, AWS config, uh, whatever those native capabilities are, it tries to sort of integrate with them fully uh, and expose them to users through that DSL to become the easiest way to consume some uh, some of these new provider features. So at, a heart, at its heart, it's effectively um, a set of policies that are written in the YAML file. Uh, each policy targets a particular resource type. Um, it has a vocabulary of hundreds of resources and Additionally, uh, you can then sort of execute that policy in different, uh, different sort of execution environments. So the engine is, is agnostic to where it's being executed. So it could be executing in a container and Jenkins box and in a serverless function. Um, it, it's agnostic to sort of where it's, uh, it, it's execution environment. Uh, but when, we, when a user does specify an execution environment, Custodian will do the work of sort of actually provisioning all the event streams and the, the serverless functions 
uh, behind the scenes for them. So the actual policy, you know, on this case, we're, we're looking at uh, Amazon's Elastic Blocks storage volumes, uh, and we're going to go ahead and filter for any volumes that are uh, not attached to an instance and that don't, don't have a particular tag retained. So we're filtering the, the set of things that uh, the set of resources for, that this policy is targeting uh, to find the things that we're looking for. And then we'll go ahead and take an, an act, a set of actions on them. So this could be, in this case, we're actually marking it for uh, an action in the future. So we might garbage collect it in three days and set out a notification. Uh, the notion around, one of the key notions around custodian is this ability to sort of decompose uh, our policies into very fine-grained, uh, using creating policies with our vocabulary, very fine-grained filters and actions. So we might have an action like stop an EC2 instance that we use for off hours, or we might use it in response to uh, a security event as a remediation activity or our incident response in that case. So continuing forward, um, the other sort of key aspect around sort of getting uh, transparency around uh, what these policies are doing is having sort of a very rich set of outputs. So custodian integrates uh, natively with all the different uh, cloud provider storages, metric services, distributed tracing, log integration, so that users have um, sort of an easy access to metrics dashboards, uh, you, know, uh, you know, resource dashboards around which policies are compliant or not compliant, um, as well as the ability to sort of take the, the raw logs um, from an optic storage and index them into, say, Elasticsearch or something. And then, of course, the other key aspect around um, doing any sort of remediation activities inside of uh, a cloud environment uh, in this real-time fashion is being able to send notifications to users. So we will, you know, enable, we enable sort of sending out to Slack and to integrating into a, a downstream Splunk, uh, sending out via email. So you can also do, uh, so here's some example policies. Um, you can sort of chain policies together and sort of create richer workflows. So um, a semantic workflow might split out into multiple sort of concrete policies. Uh, in this case, we've got sort of a policy looking for uh, EC2 instances that are not appropriately tagged and then um, having them uh, being marked for a, a being stopped at a future date. So this is giving a chance uh, in combination with, say, a notification for a, the end user who provisioned that resource to actually uh, remediate, the, remediate themselves. If not, then the policy will come back through. So a lot of concern and governance here is around not really, uh, you know, an organization may have hundreds of application teams. And in this context, what we're really looking to do is to give sort of a centralized team, um, either security, operations, uh, you know, compliance, a, an ability to sort of have a, a ground-based assurance that regardless of what tools and application teams you need to provision, be it Terraform, be it CloudFormation, be it you know, research templates, that, the, that their cloud environment is, is sort of conformant to a, a known baseline that they're defining in these policies. So what can you do with Custodian? Um, lots of things. So a lot of these sort of filters and actions, because they're, they're small and composable, um, are reusable to create as Lego bricks to create all kinds of things. Um, we have, uh, we'll get to some of our community later, but we have thousands of users using it for every conceivable thing um, that, uh, that, that they've been able to express. And, and a lot of these things are things that, you know, we as the authors uh, of some of the tools and containers contributors uh, didn't originally think of. So looking at sort of what does it look like to run and deploy this thing, um, so the it's a one line install. It's a stateless engine. So it, it as far as getting started, uh, you can it's you know you can Docker and Docker run it. You can uh, pip install. Uh, the tool itself is written in Python, uh, and then of course you have these rich vocabulary of execution modes that the tool will actually provision uh, and hook up the event streams for. Uh, the and then. As it's uh, the tools also abstract out to where it's getting this data. So it's uh, the policy execution modes are are going to define sort of where it's running, and the policies themselves are fairly isomorphic to what that location is. And then the policy themselves can also pull their source or data from different places. So 
In some cases, a given execution mode will, will just take whatever's in the event stream. In some cases, it'll go to sort of the described API calls that are available from the cloud, like the gets. Um, in some cases, they'll, they'll use a CMDB resource database uh, as far as where they're getting th this information to start processing. So I'm gonna hand this over to Andy uh, from Microsoft. Hi, um, can everybody hear me? Uh, I'll just do a quick intro too. Uh, my name is Andy Long, I'm an engineering manager at Microsoft. Um, and over the past year and a half, we've uh, been contributing um, heavily into um, adding support for Azure in Cloud Custodian. And uh, one of the, the big components was having compliance as code. Um, and this is, has been really effective for um, customers that we worked with and internally at Microsoft too, where um, having your compliance, you know, um, <clears throat> the policies are written and stored in YAML files and um, it gives us the ability to version them, um, actually um, go through a good like uh, pipeline and process for um, deploying them. Uh, we built a lot of tooling in Cloud Custodian around it as well. Uh, we have a tool called Policy Stream that allows to, us to look at um, a Git repository's history and compare it to um, the changes in the policies over time. And all these have effectively made the, um, added a lot more rigor to um, compliance uh, and um, actually how um, you do end up deploying these policies. Uh, we've seen integrations um, with um, the policy deployments with Drone, Jenkins, uh, Azure DevOps, and, um, and this has effectively been a really co important component um, going forward um, in the space that we have here. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And on the Azure side, um, it's similar to what Kapil was saying, uh, we, we built um, integration with Azure Functions so that that could be one of the hosting environments for a custodian. Uh, in addition to that, you, you know, you can always run custodian in a VM or um, a container, uh, whatever you choose um, that's the best fit for, your, um, for uh, your situation. And so in particular with Azure, we're using, leveraging Azure Functions as the serverless offering. And um, we're actually able to subscribe to events um, that are happening inside Azure, uh, your Azure subscription uh, via event grid and we're triggering off of those events to perform some action. Um, this is an example of uh, a simple policy uh, around um, Key Vault. And here when a Key Vault um, it actually uh, exhibits a, a write event, uh, what we're, we're doing is we're filtering for a particular tag, which is a creator email. And then the, um, the action that um, is performed when there is no creator email on the tag here um, is to actually go ahead and, and tag that. Uh, this is a really important scenario to just help with like ownership of resources as um, developers and even in production, uh, people are deploying um, a lot of these resources, being able to map it back to like, you know, um, who is the, uh, the ultimate owner is really helpful. Um, we can go to the next slide. I added a, a little flow here to just um, help with the visualization. So Azure subscriptions can emit uh, activity logs that uh, we subscribe through um, Event Grid, uh, another Azure service. Um, we plumb this into an Azure queue, which actually is a mechanism to, that we can deliver this really anywhere. And uh, one of the hosting options, like I alluded to, was Azure Functions that will go and listen to this, um, the queue, um, DQ messages. Um, there, that's where Custodian actually executes. Um, the outputs are um, potentially stored in Azure Storage. Um, the, we have some other options. And then um, a lot of the metrics and executions, ex exceptions, anything else that um, is around the monitoring of the function actually is stored in Application Insights, which is a, uh, it would just comp uh, under the Azure Monitor uh, umbrella. So we have a really nice flow for um, uh, customers that are running Custodian in production where um, you can have all um, all the logs integrate right actually into the, the native of Azure solutions, but also you have the flexibility to output it really wherever you want. Um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, one, one, one back. Uh, one thing to really point out oh, where um, kind of custodian fits into the, the, the grander picture for Azure in, in our context was that we were looking for um, something that will complement all the other Azure native services. And you can do, you can um, essentially establish a, a very similar um, diagram for all the other, other cloud providers that we're also associated with, where uh, custodian kind of fits in where um, 
in, in conjunction with all these other governance tools that Azure actually supports natively, which is very important for um, customers that we've um, worked with because they want to use the Azure native tools, but then there's always a point where as their governance uh, impl implementation matures, they're looking for more customization. And also uh, when you look at um, customers that um, have more multi-cloud um, deployments, having something that they that can actually unify that and also um, is, is consistent with all the clouds to help with their governance story. So um, this uh, this is just a really important aspect um, that we're not using cloud students to replace anything, but it's actually just complements all, all of the stuff that already exists in the space. Thank you. I'll hand it back to Kapil. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, most of our uh, GCP contributors are actually out of Eastern Europe, so weren't able to attend. Um, but the logical notion is that these policies are uh, look like this is a policy for GCP that will, anytime you start an instance, will effectively say, um, uh, if it's got a quarantine tag, then go ahead and stop it. Um, now, it, it's important to keep in mind, like that that workflow that sort of Andy showed, and that um, and that is also present for for GCP, the, sort of this flow diagram. All this is sort of um, it's not uh, the user doesn't have to do this. It has to provision all these things. And when you run custodian command line and give this policy with that execution mode, it will go ahead and do all the wiring and provisioning for the, for the user. So that they can, um, so that they're they don't really have a lot of DevOps uh, responsibilities as far as what they need to do. Um, and all of this. So in addition to the stateless rules engine, we have sort of this provisioning around uh, the policies and their execution environments, and that's all sort of you know delta diff uh, state goal based, uh, where uh, an update to a policy will do an incremental update to the provisioned infrastructure. But the, I think it's a, and sort of switching out to sort of some of the same capability in AWS. Like, so this is, ends up being a super powerful capability from a, a governance perspective. A lot of custodian is geared towards sort of, uh, and from a real time perspective, is geared towards sort of these de detective controls. Um, you know, anything that users can express in via the IAM language of their provider, we, we would go ahead and recommend they do that first. Um, a lot of IAM decisioning is, is maybe, um, not as flexible for some of the nuances that people want to express in policies. Uh, but so this ability to sort of introspect the API call, uh, call stream that's happening against the, their provider infrastructure in real time to make sure that the things that are being created are compliant to policy um, ends up being a, a really powerful capability. Uh, and so just again, as another example, sort of integrating with the, whatever the cloud providers native capabilities are, um, one example here is with AWS Config um, is being able to take a, a given policy, uh, simply switch out the mode to Config role and have it deploy it as as a uh, as a custom Config role within that native service. Um, from a multi-cloud perspective, around the different providers, you know, we cover off on sort of the key feature set, but API subscription. Observ observation capability exists sort of natively across all the providers. Um, and then of course, logging metrics, multi-account support um, exists as well. So Custodian is also an umbrella project around uh, several different tools that sort of help uh, users around auto like automation or operations. Uh, C7 and org is our sort of parallel multi-account, uh, multi-subscription, multi-project execution. Uh, where it will allow for a user to take a, uh, a set of uh, policies and execute in parallel across accounts, regions, et cetera. Um, the other component to that is sort of our, our notification system, which is you see in the mailer, um, can be deployed as a serverless function or, or run within a container. Um, and it's going to sort of drain our, our it'll, it sort of subscribes to uh, a data flow of actions from policies that are trying to do notifications and then can do formatting and delivery to multiple different uh, downstream channels. Uh, it's sort of just giving a, a little bit more flavor for around sort of the operations uh, cost and, and security aspects. Um, this is a policy that, you know, in the same way that uh, Andy's uh, policy was tagging on key vault creators um, this policy subscribes anytime someone creates an S3 bucket to go ahead and uh, add the whoever created it as a owner tag to that uh, to that resource. 
uh, from a cost savings perspective, you know, this is mostly about sort of taking that, taking the, the ability to look at a resource, look at its metric stream, try to find things that are sort of underutilized for, for their for their size and send out notifications or in some cases do resizing um, around them. And of course, you can also do off hours. Uh, from an IAM perspective, you know, the policy on the left ends up being is a config rule that will use the IAM simulator against the, the instance roles associated to it to find any, any instances that have the ability how the IAM to actually create another uh, IAM user. And so this will end up being sort of flagged as overprivileged uh, from on inside of the config dashboard. Uh, on, the, on the right side, where there's a separate policy here that will look for uh, access keys that are haven't been used in 120 days, and then go ahead and post a finding into uh, another native service, AWS Security Hub, uh, where they'll be, they'll be uh, sort of correlated as a, an additional finding um, and triage uh, from there. So talking about the community, uh, we've got many different channels. Uh, we've got our main homepage, and we're primarily on GitHub. Uh, from a chat perspective, we have about, we, we've been using Gitter, uh, about 1,000 users in, in chat. Um, and from a project stats perspective, uh, we've got about 230 contributors, uh, you know, lots of unit tests, uh, about 25,000 downloads a month, uh, well over uh, a million total downloads. Uh, looks looking at 2019, uh, we've had about 100 contributors merging about you know 750 pull requests, um, and this is sort of breaking it out by which particular uh, provider or feature that they were working on, um, and so it's it's pretty evenly split um, across uh, across the core and and the different providers. Um, we've been starting to pick up on some of our Kubernetes stuff, but I can talk through that, some of that on our roadmap. Uh, as far as just sort of breaking it up by companies, uh, this is sort of the, the current breakdown, um, as long as the top contributors and who are also, uh, all those top contributors are also maintainers as well. Um, from a principles perspective, you know, Custodian tries to focus on being operationally simple, um, a lot of users, you know, you know, it, it gets, tends to be used in a lot of enterprise contexts, but it also tends to be used um, sort of in smaller shops as sort of just one-off cost, cost optimization. So we want it to be fairly simple to, to, to run and operate. Um, and so we try to integrate with the native services as much as possible, partly to alleviate um, any operational burden from, from an end user. Uh, we want to sort of keep the the core fairly simple and minimized from a, a, a vocabulary that we're introducing to users. Like we have, you know, well, you know, probably a thousand different filters and actions and vocabularies and re, and, of resources. Uh, and so, just trying to make those fairly orthogonal, so uh, and simple for for users to get uh, understanding with. Uh, all this stuff is auto is you know the the schema validation and the dry run capability that we run in CI. You know, we use JSON schema. Um, all of those filters and actions and capabilities are, are automatically documented uh, out from the code into our doc site as a reference documentation. So as far as our roadmap, um, the tool itself is written in Python. Uh, we're looking at sort of uh, how we na navigate the, the end of life of Python 2.7, uh, given a lot of enterprise users and distributions. Um, uh, are, are using enterprise distributions, which tend to be a little bit later on, on picking up that deprecation, uh, as well as sort of uh, introducing a bit of lazy loading uh, just to, as we expand out the, the number of features we have, we want to make sure that we're being, uh, being simple around cold starts and CLI uh, execution as far as not needing to load anything more than we need to. Uh, some structured logging. Uh, this is sort of our internal to-do list. Um, I'm not going to gloss. Oh, I'm going to gloss over it. So, but feel free to ask questions. Um, as far as uh, Kubernetes integration, we, we have a Kubernetes provider. It's been it's pretty minimal at the moment. Um, and it sort of allows for sort of pull-based querying on Kubernetes resources and sort of doing expressing uh, policies on on most of the Kubernetes built-ins across the application 
namespace as well as uh, CRDs. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and, and sort of ramp that up as far as building out our emission controller facilities. Um, and to date, Custodian has also been fairly unopinionated about how people deploy. You know, we've seen Jenkins and and you know Fargate and uh, Kubernetes and GitLab CI. And so I think Kubernetes offers us a, a good baseline to actually start having an opinionated deployment um, as far as what is good operations and good deployment of, Kubernetes, of a custodian management uh, framework look like uh, on top of Kubernetes. So, any questions? Uh, hi, Kapil. Uh, this is Ash. Great presentation, you guys. Uh, Quick question. So how, how does this project compare with the open policy agent or uh, do you see any complementing features, distinctions or, uh, yeah, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, so, uh, great question. Uh, open policy agent is, is, has, I think, I think there's some complementary features. Like I think open policy agent does a really great job of enabling sort of, edge-based decisioning um, around like, and sort of very decoupled from uh, data sets. Uh, the, the, the notion for us is that we wanted to have that sort of the real-time behavior around the cloud environments for us was sort of where we started off. Um, and OPA started off around sort of Kubernetes um, as far as it's, it's some of the tighter integrations. And it's been around in this ecosystem for a long time. Uh, for us, this is sort of growing out our accessibility to cover sort of the full space around infrastructure. If we look at where sort of opens gone, as far as it's decisioning, a lot of it's going out to sort of edge, like, you know, SSH integration or, and so it's a very decoupled engine. Um, and so that's been really nice. One of the things that sort of separates the two is that OPA wants to sort of keep a full, a full inventory in memory, as far as being able to do that decisioning. Uh, custodian itself doesn't really, is typically going to pull uh, pull on demand any additional information it needs from third party data sources. So uh, a lot of the filters that we're using are like are going to do additional API calls into a cloud environment um, to to sort of verify things. So for example, um, validating that a launch config is valid requires us verifying the security groups, the image, et cetera, around it. Whereas uh, OPA is typically trying to do fairly localized decisioning around whatever it has in, in memory at that moment. Cool. Uh, so, so do you see a uh, cloud custodian not being running at the edge as like OPA is? It's more on the uh, validation path. That's what you think. That's what you see. Uh, cloud custodian. We're, yeah, we're typically operating on the control plane directly. We're not necessarily doing edge decisioning um, to the extent that the control plane, like, so we'll do like control plane integration with whatever the control plane event stream is uh, to do validation and enforcement. Um, of course, we can run, be run incrementally across the partial subset, uh, be run in dry run, run on you know a periodic basis. Like it doesn't have to hook up to the event stream, but we're always operating against whatever the control stream, the control plane's API and event streams are. Uh, whereas with OPA, I think you can you can do some of that. Um, I think as far as what the built-in integrations are today, like the only place that, that I think a valid statement is really around uh, sort of Kubernetes uh, specific integration as far as Gatekeeper. Uh, but if you look at sort of in the wild where it goes, it's typically, um, it's typically uh, uh, with a smaller footprint out towards the edge. And I think there's some, I, I have some notional sort of, research experiments I'd like to do uh, now that OPA has sort of been, uh, has some support for compiling Rego to WASM that it might be interesting to explore additional integrations, but uh, that's sort of speculative at this point. Ooh, thank you. So Ash, do you yeah. have, um, do you concur with that? Are there things about where do you see the overlaps and differences or, I mean, it's okay if you don't know any more than what was just said, but I wanted to um, toss that question back to you. 
Uh, sure. So. Uh, Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So like, like uh, I think like some of the points Kapil mentioned makes sense. Uh, OPA, like uh, you can run it on the edge and it's more focused on performance and low latency use cases like uh, authorization. Uh, like for cloud custodian, I would say since it's pulling everything down during eval time, that's not a very favorable use case. Uh, so that, I would see that one distinction between the way OPA and cloud custodian gets used. Um, and yeah, OPA was started off uh, more towards Kubernetes, but it's a general purpose policy engine. So I could see a way of integrating it with some of these use cases where you're putting cloud custodian with uh, AWS or GCP. So yeah, I, there's overlap with those kind of use cases like admission control, uh, but performance wise, like OPA running on the edges, uh, I would believe it's much more performant rather than um, pulling because it doesn't it does everything locally that's that's uh, yeah that would be my initial thoughts about this thanks ash i have a bunch of questions but i wanted to let the group ask questions first does anybody else have questions all right i'll dive in so um, I noticed your GCP uh, uh, support is in, in beta and um, oh, way early we had an issue where we um, had wanted to, where our issue meaning we file issues when we want to invite people to talk about things. Um, and there was an idea that we would invite Cloud Custodian and for SETI because at that time, if I recall correctly, Cloud Custodian was for AWS and for SETI was just for GCP. And now I was excited to see that um, one of the platforms had um, embraced cross-cloud um, support. And I was wondering whether you reached out to Forseti and um, you know, if, if it seems like that being a Google project, they could potentially contribute a lot of the Google stuff. And maybe we don't, you know, like if, there, if, if it would make any sense to um, invite them to participate or maybe you've had those conversations. Absolutely. So there, there's, you know, there's been a number of discussions uh, over custodian's lifetime with uh, all the cloud providers. Um, and there, there have been some contributions from Google, um, not directly from the Forseti team. Uh, you know, there's a significant delta. Like I looked at Forseti heavily uh, before I started working on GCP support a few years ago. Um, I, I think, you know, Especially moving into uh, CNCF, I think that there's there's a strong opportunity there for getting some contributions from the Forseti. If I was going to compare and contrast sort of what they do today, um, uh, Forseti is typically doing sort of a running poll of all the resources or integrating with uh, cloud asset inventory, um, running a set of rules and dropping it into a database as a run um, from a architecture perspective around what, what our goals are as far as offering sort of that real-time response. Um, it wasn't something that Forseti was really doing uh, when we looked at it. And I, I don't think it's added that in the interim sense, but potentially it's on the roadmap. So what we sort of targeted initially was this capability around sort of doing that real-time integration. So uh, hooking up, you know, uh, cloud audit logs to pub subtopics to Google Cloud Functions and enabling these policies to be deployed uh, out there to, uh, to be able to do real-time response on the order of a few seconds uh, to, to respond to events as opposed to getting a database on a polling basis uh, every few hours that, that has some set of things that need to be remediated. Uh, we've generally found that from a remediation perspective, um, if we can remediate things and send notification to the user um, immediately that we, they, they have a much better experience. Like they're not setting up an in instance and getting it all configured and deploying their application. And then a few hours later, having it sort of uh, removed um, outside of say their deployment or their operation, uh, their change order window. Uh, whereas with this, they sort of get that immediate feedback. They have an email in their inbox and, and within a minute, the resource is immediately, you know, remediated and uh, it tends to be a much nicer flow from uh, an end user perspective. But uh, to answer the question, yes, we would love to have for, uh, additional contribution from the Forseti team. Um, they've done a lot of work around sort of 
uh, a set of, you know, uh, a, a static set of rules around what is sort of best practice in their environment. And so that's something that we would love to collaborate with and potentially be able to express in custodian policies going forward. Right. And that kind of leads me to, um, like, thank you for the compare contrast of the architecture because I had looked at it a couple of years ago, but that was a while back. And um, one of the things that um, that reminds me of is that uh, it's been a while since I did application development, um, but I remember in the early days of Lambda, um, it, they, they were a lot, it wasn't, um, I, I haven't heard that Amazon has SLAs around if an event happens, your Lambda always gets executed. And in the early days, it was actually pretty not complete. And so there's always a trade-off between how real time you can be and how um, accurate you can be. And so what are your thoughts around um, compliance, particularly where, you know, is it okay to miss an event because you, there are other processes that are not cloud custodian that you expect to have happening? Or does cloud cu custodian also provide some kind of assurance that even if an event didn't get fired, we're still going to check compliance on something? Yeah, so the custodian supports sort of both sort of looking at the whole fleet uh, and evaluating the whatever everything is, the, the state of everything at the moment, as well as sort of integrating with these event-based things. Uh, generally speaking, the event-based things have, or like it, it seems to be fairly, fairly solid, uh, like 99.99, but yes, they're from a percentage possibility of something going wrong in the cloud, then at scale, of course, that that is a, a certainty. Uh, having the ability to do sort of periodic poll evaluate of the whole fleet is also a baseline capability. Um, it's really just switching out the execution mode from sort of being event-based uh, either on you know, Cloud, CloudTrail or um, Azure Functions uh, to being to removing that. And the default there is just to pull the existing resource set. So to clarify, is that a capability now or is that something you're thinking of looking at in the future? Uh, that's, that's a built-in capability now. Okay, so people can decide how 100% they want to be based on the particular compliance they're doing. Like maybe if they're exactly. like turning off an instance during off hours, it's not that important if 90, you know, 0.001% of the time doesn't happen. But if it's, well, maybe my bucket is wide open to the internet, that's not okay. Right, and, and some of the execution modes we integrate with are doing the extra behind the scenes work as far as, uh, you know, like say where you're deployed as a config role in AWS, behind the scenes that's, you know, doing the event stream as well as doing polling and then feeding that information back to us. So from a policy perspective, that wouldn't need to be sort of duplicated as two policies, one as a, you know, full fleet evaluation and one as an event evaluation. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, how, how custodian users typically are authoring is they'll take in a, they'll write a policy they'll run it against the whole fleet and then they'll start adding in the event base, uh, the event basis that they want it to execute on. So um, even in development, they're, they're sort of, you know, go, switching between modes sort of seamlessly as they uh, are trying things out. Right. So maybe uh, you can address um, the question from chat, which is that um, Steve Hatfield says in chat, um, if there are any roadmap items for reporting overall health in contrast to only viewing non-compliant resources. Great question. Um, so health is interesting. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the context of that is sort of like generally general cloud infrastructure. The ability to filter and sort of do metrics queries allows you to sort of operate on many different expressible parameters. So, you know, we, we brought up the example around sort of cost optimization. Um, you know, looking for oversized use resources using metrics, but you can also find sort of flagging resources. There's a lot of operations work that Custodian uh, tries to automate, like um, in the context uh, of AWS, you might have, uh, you know, auto scaling groups weekly reference their resources. So, you know, we've seen, you know, operational environments where the auto scale group is just continually trying to spin up instances and it can't because it's misconfigured. And so, 
uh, to certainly support sort of detecting, like actually going through and validating that, um, as well as sort of subscribing to additional event streams around, uh, you know, launch failures, uh, around instances, uh, additionally in, in AWS. And AWS is where it started off initially about four years ago. And so it definitely has the richest integration. Um, there's also support for your personal, I think it's called personal help dashboard, uh, which is a horrible name, but it's sort of the underlying uh, uh, data center cloud infrastructure event uh, around a service. So you can actually subscribe to say, you know, anytime an EBS volume is lost or anytime, um, you know, there's an outage incident uh, status page update uh, that you go ahead and notify through the application team that those resources are affecting. Um, and so there's rich capability around doing operational work uh, with custodian. Um, it, they're, those, those, tend to, those capabilities tend to divide differently across different clouds and what those clouds expose natively that it can, that custodian can use as, as an event stream. I don't know if Steven is still around to, to see if that answered the question. It sounded like he had to drop off. It looks like we have another question. Like there's another the chat. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so policy mistakes. So Tissoni has built in safety belts. Uh, like obviously any, anytime, you know, doing remediation at scale or, or doing sort of mass operations around infrastructure at scale, it, it's, it's a good best practice to have. Uh, some sort of some safety belt capability, and some of this derives from this whole notion of compliance as code. Like in in most teams, will set up uh, a CI infrastructure, so they're doing. They've got Jenkins that's there that you know, on a pull request is going to go ahead and do a schema validation of the file uh, using JSON schema, and I'll go ahead and do a dry run of the policies that are there. Now, a dry run is not going to do any. Uh, remediation any act you know, will not take any actions on resources. It's simply going to get show you the set of resources that you filtered to, um, and then those can post back as sort of a uh, to the pull request or as a comment uh, with regards to um, sort of what this what these policies are going to affect. And Andy had touched upon um, sort of our the tool we have called Policy Stream, uh, and Policy Stream is you know we we talk excess code is all about sort of workflows. Um, but one of the things that policy stream does for us is it also makes this custodian policies compliance as code also something that's machine readable so that you can actually look at the, the stream of changes through a Git history from a machine readable perspective of saying, you know, these policies got added, these policies got removed, this policy got updated. And actually, so getting a sort of a diff of just what policy, what the policy changes from a set of uh, commits and then executing a dry run, say, just on that small, smaller delta. From uh, going back to the sort of the safety belt suspenders, uh, Custodian has the ability to say, if we're ever going to touch more than 5% of the fleet, uh, stop. Or if we're ever going to touch more than two resources, then stop. Uh, and so that's sort of a built-in capability as far as safety belt um, with regards to policy execution and, and, and in affecting a larger population than, than you might expect. Of course, from an exception perspective, you know, one of the, the one of the common rules I've, I've noticed is that every rule has its own exception, um, is the ability to sort of pull in exception lists around particular policies and source them from, from URLs, from S3, from, from JSON feeds and CSVs, uh, be it around like this particular uh, image or instance is exempt from these particular policies and using sort of the intrinsic, uh, using external integrations as far as defining what, those, what, those, what that set is. Thanks. Look like looks like Stephen had a follow up. Yeah. So you can go ahead and so as far as sort of doing whole fleet evaluation, you can very much do that. You can evaluate the whole fleet, determine uh, you know this particular these particular instances don't match this particular set of criteria, and then look at that as a whole, and then you can actually do an aggregate query, an aggregate filter that says if this is n percent of the population or if there's more than 50 of these things then proceed to action um, 
so you, the event so the event stream is really tied to execution mode, but the default execution mode is effectively evaluating the whole fleet. And there are filters that are set up to doing uh, sort of group group analysis um, around the set of resources that are there uh, as gate as additional filters. So um, we've just got ten minutes left, um, so I wanted to make sure that to allocate some time to answer your question, which is what's next. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, and so I would like to draw everybody's attention to at the I added to the agenda. The um, I'll actually do this backwards a little bit. Um, there's a uh, low. There's a. This is. It's come up a lot that it's not clear to many people what exactly happens in. TOC on board, like TOC decision making and how does a project get onboarded? How are decisions made in the um, CNCF? And um, it's complicated by the fact that this has changed over time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, I have uh, been in a bunch of these meetings and been around for a little while and been the recipient of, I don't know what's going on and how do we become a CNCF SIG? Um, that lasted many months. So I, um, and I've been a fan of this, this markdown flowchart maker. So I took a um, discussion from last summer that was in a, you know, diagram tool and I turned it into, and I, you know, filtered in a bunch of other discussions that I've heard um, in various meetings and made this flowchart. So this is not adopted but um, this is my attempt to write down what I think everybody is talking about. And nobody has said, this is terribly wrong. And so um, I thought I would just kind of tell everybody about this. I don't think we have time to have a deep discussion about it, but, um, but everyone in the group and um, folks from Cloud Custodian, you should feel uh, free, in fact, obliged to look at this carefully and tell me I'm wrong and say where this doesn't make any sense and we can elaborate because um, I think there is a idea that um, the TOC would like the, C the SIGs to participate in making it so that the TOC has more bandwidth by kind of pre-flighting all of the, um, does, is this project a fit without making right. a decision but a recommendation, right? So that if projects are really clearly not a fit, they get quick feedback. If there's a bunch of discussions, it can happen in parallel across the different SIGs. Um, I think that there's, a, there's some nuance to like, can things get stuck in the SIG? What would happen if the project disagrees with what the SIG said, blah, 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 right? There's a lot of um, detail that would need to be worked out. But the truth is um, that the um, spirit of this is that there's a long queue of projects that would like to present to the TOC and then they present to the TOC, but that then there's like a Q and a discussion due diligence thing that there just isn't enough bandwidth on the TOC to do. Sure. And um, so this is an effort to parallelize it. So this is my understanding of what I think we're doing. So <laughs> we're going to go forth. We can go forth down this path. If you don't like this path, then con like then we can change it. But um, by default, we'll go with my understanding of how things are going. <laughs> so, which is that like basically you were um, sent to us to be to say, hey, engage with the SIG. Um, you're interested in becoming part of the CNCF. So, the different ways that you can engage is, of course, we you know we we're excited to have you present here. We'd also um, encourage you to like you know participate, and we have a new members page and. Um, that can help speed things up because you're helping us get through our backlog. Um, also, uh, we I'd encourage you to go look and see, are there other projects where Cloud Custodian could be useful? I mean, you're already connected to Kubernetes, of course, but maybe there are some other projects that it would make sense for them to use Cloud Custodian or you to use them or something, something. Um, so that's, I think, just sort of a generally good idea because those questions may come up if there is an obvious uh, connection that may not be obvious to you if you're new to the CNCF or even obvious to all of us. So um, there, uh, there's a due diligence process 
which right now is multiple due diligence processes, um, which we have on deck to sort out. So like in the next weeks, if you hadn't arrived, we would be working on clarifying that process. Um, so, uh, so I just want to let you know. Yeah. Um, and then as part of that, um, what we've talked about informally is that um, it would make sense to us, to me and a couple people I've talked to, that as part of that process, we have this self-assessment that is a document that is generally produced by the project as a way to explain what the project is and what its security posture is. And so um, one idea is that you, if, if you are enthusiastic and you think that this would be helpful to you and to us, you could go, you could produce a self-assessment, which would speed things up. Um, and then the other option is you could say, wow, that looks like a ton of work. I'm not sure we're up for that and wait until we decide whether this is required or if there's a lighter weight process. Yeah, so that, that's a, I have a few questions there. Um, I'm just trying to understand what the, what the process is because I've seen projects go through six security assessments, um, projects that are already in, uh, in CMTF. So it seems like it was independent from sort of the inbound activity towards the talk. And so I'm just trying to understand, is that being defined as a prerequisite? And then having looked at that process, it looks mostly like it's going through the CIA, CII badge app status stuff. Um, is there additional stuff beyond that that well, is something that you're looking for? So I think that, well, to answer your question, we've done two assessments. In Toto was done as a prerequisite to a TOC recommendation. And then there was some confusion about whether that was a good idea and maybe we shouldn't require people to do an assessment. Yet we wanted to do assessments of the people who were the projects that were already in CNCF. So we invited OPA um, to do our second assessment, which was a very collaborative process. A Ash is here who really helped, you know, steer that process so that we could refine the process. And so our goal is to, um, well, we will definitely do assessments of all the security related projects that are part of the CNCF. And then we are figuring out what our bandwidth is to assess projects that are, of course, have security needs, but are not security projects. And we, you know, we're kind of trying to figure out whether um, we have enough bandwidth to just do all of them or whether we're going to prioritize them in some way. Right now, a lot of it is prioritized about projects that come to us or we do outreach for. And so, um, so it's, it's, we're exploring whether we will have a lighter weight, do, whether the security assessment will be, you know, either recommended or required or, well, just think about doing this sometime, you know, or any, anywhere in between. And so that hasn't been, that's not decisional and you've sort of caught us in the midst of having this process and we basically have said that until we've done five security assessments and we've evaluated our process of doing so and we know we can say if somebody comes to us or the toc says do an assessment we can say yep it'll be done in n weeks we're we're shooting for n equal three right now until we can assert that it will definitely take this amount of time we're not going to make it a requirement so so you're in this interim stage. Does that help? I'm still unclear on kind of where to go from here. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to speak for Capil there, but um, it sounds like as you're going through this process and trying to establish what exactly it is, it sounds like this project could be used as kind of a, I guess, a test case to um, finalize or um, firm up what the process yeah, is exactly yeah. or you could say whoa w w we'll wait until your process is done so oh and to answer your question about the self-assessment the ci best practices is hardly the most important or biggest part of it although like it's a basic checklist of like if you're not doing 90 percent of the basic stuff like we're a little worried about you and it's, more, it's less that you need to do it because there certainly could be projects accepted into the sandbox that 
are experimental and they're like, we're excited about them and we're just like, oh, just FYI, this is a set of things you ought to be doing, right? And just queue it up before incubation or whatever. But it's more that like, that's, um, that's the, like the least of your concerns. Um, and my guess is that that would not be arduous for any project that is security focused or at the maturity of cloud custodian. The important part, most of this self-assessment is just like some common format for what does your project do? The big part of it is the security analysis. What's your threat model? This is something that is rarely like really surfaced in a concise way for open source projects. And so this is the meat of it, which is that you, you explain to us what you think your um, security posture is and, and what are the threat potential threats by adding your thing into the mix, right? Because adding a, a, a generally when you, you're adding a project which is supposed to increase your security, that there, that's huge, huge benefit. But of course you have to evaluate that that's another attack surface. And so we want to just streamline that and you know, have an opportunity to discuss that and think it through. So that's kind of like the big part of it. And so one of the things that I think might work well, it, and I'd really like your feedback on, which we can do asynchronously because I know it's the top of the hour, which is if you were to like look at this and say, well, how much work would it be for you to produce that? Would that be a reasonable requirement for you to produce that? And then the actual self-assessment may or may not be necessary at this stage. Uh, I think we could try to get that kicked out relatively quickly. Um, I'm just looking at the, uh, the holidays impending and uh, people sort of meandering out on vacation and, and family time that sort of where that puts us from your three week target time frame to well, it's the holidays and it's going to take, you know, two months. Well, um, we probably so wouldn't just start to... anything before the holidays in any case, right? So, yeah. but the due diligence, like, so this is what we're exploring is that maybe we have a lighter weight due diligence, which is just like, do we have any big concerns that would be blocking? Are we, where are we on the realm of, no, we recommend the TOC not touch this thing or yay, please, we love them, right? Like there's a spectrum and I'm completely exaggerating how we would present this. We generally present things as these are the benefits and, you know, challenges of this project. And so, um, but then, but that what the, the TOC is really looking for us to prioritize different projects for them to look at along with some well-ordered data about the project. Okay. I think we could take a stab at that and, and work with uh, whoever is interested to help the self-assessment and some of the threat models. Um, most yeah. of the threat models here are really around controlling access to the Git repo that has the policies that Katerian is executing with and then uh, sort of trying to hijack one of the functions that it's deployed. But yeah, we can, I can walk through on that. The, yeah. And then as far as the project description and the CII review, that, that's relatively straightforward. So uh, if there's someone who wants, we created a Cloud Custodian uh, Slack channel for around the security assessment um, already. So if anybody's interested, feel free to join in that Slack channel and we can start uh, coordinating on content. Um, I believe it's mostly set up as pull requests to the SIGS repo. Yeah, that, that Slack channel seems like a good place to coordinate further activity. And, and Kapil, I can tell you, um, you know, we're highly motivated to help push this through so um, we can add resources to this as necessary to streamline the process. So, um, awesome. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah, and sorry. It's been the last two assessments, we started with a, a Google Doc and then had people comment on it, but it could certainly start with a pull request, whatever is your preference for the starter doc. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, just the discoverability of Google Docs isn't always great unless they're, they're linked in from somewhere. So maybe we just have an issue with that. Well, um, yeah, we always start with then, it. And like, okay. If you don't have okay, a, we can do a Google Doc. If you don't have a security, if you don't have an issue yet, there's a template for a security assessment. So you would just kick that off, and there's like a bunch of things to fill in, and one of them is the self assessment. Sounds good. All right. Great. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's five past, so I'll close the meeting. 
But um, folks, feel free to chime in on Slack um, and if there's things that we didn't cover that we need to coordinate. And then next week will be our more usual working group meeting. Um, I think there are some topics that people are thinking of raising, um, but then we'll have check-ins and discussion of what's uh, top of mind for folks. Great. Right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. And thanks very much, folks from Cloud Custodians. This was a great presentation and discussion. Awesome.